Well, I'd love for you to help me out at the beginning of this message. And how you can help me out is by repeating these words after me. Would you say these words? I'd rather aim at something and miss it than to aim at nothing and hit it. So just this past week, I heard one of our boys' coaches of their little league team uh, they were talking to the team about getting up to bat and hitting the ball. If you're wondering why I talk about baseball every week, it's because it's actually coming to an end. I think we have one more game left for both boys. Um, so that's why. We're just, we're just uh, neck deep, ear deep, forehead deep. Can you get any deeper? Uh, we're just neck deep in, in Little League right now, baseball season. All of the gaps that we did have were all filled up with... Uh, baseball. And so, uh, but I I overheard the the coaches, we go to our boys' practices um, because we want to be active part of our children, of their lives and baseball. So if we hear anything at, on the baseball field, we want to be able to take it home and to, to, to incorporate that at home um, in our yard or whatever, you know, just to help them out so they're not by themselves. And so we overheard the coach uh, talking to the boys about getting up to bat and hitting the ball because some of the boys, they'll get up to bat and they'll, they'll swing and they'll hit the ball. That's good. Others will swing, swing the bat and they'll miss the ball. That's okay. But then there are those others who will get up to bat and just watch the ball go by, just pitch after pitch after pitch. They have all the tools necessary. We've done all the practicing. They'll have the bat there. This is my bat. And they'll get up to the bat. They look like they're going to just pound that ball. And the ball comes. And they just look at it. They just let it go by. And so the coach was really, he was, he was taking a step from, because we had done a lot of practicing. Um, and so in this practice toward the end of the season, he's, he was getting more into the, the psychology um, of baseball, different scenarios and different things that maybe uh, you can't be taught unless you're like in a, kind of like a classroom setting. And so he was talking to them about uh, this situation and talking about how, how this, the same thing. If you just sit there and you just watch the ball pitch after pitch, if you're lucky, maybe you'll, you'll get a walk and you'll be able to take your base. But most of the time, if you don't swing the bat, you're going to end up striking out. And what I've noticed is that if you don't swing the bat, of the time, you will never be able to hit the ball. Sounds super logical. Using common sense. Because you can't hit what you don't swing at. And there's a ton of different reasons why a player will choose not to swing the bat. Maybe they got hit by the ball earlier in the season or maybe uh, earlier in the game. And, and they'll have this, this insecurity and every time they see the ball coming toward them, they, they, they think that the, the ball is gonna, they're gonna get, hit them. And so they freeze. Maybe they saw one of their teammates, maybe the ball didn't hit them, but they saw one of their teammates get hit by the ball and now they have this insecurity that the ball is gonna hit them too. Sometimes the player is, is just hoping that the pitcher won't pitch a strike. And they'll just be able to make it easy and get it easy and just be able to walk to first. Whatever the reason, if the player doesn't swing the bat, they're leaving the outcome. They're leaving the end result in someone else's hands. And when the coach was explaining this to the team, he said something that really stuck out and it's really stuck with me. He said, I'd rather see you, you boys go down swinging than to go down just looking. Because if you go down swinging, at least I know that you were trying. At least I know you were making some effort. But if you don't choose to swing the bat, you're not even giving yourself or your team a chance. And I couldn't help but to relate that message to my own life and to yours. I was thinking about you guys. If I don't, choose. If I let someone else choose for me, 
If I allow someone else who doesn't even know me or doesn't even have my best interest in mind to do the choosing for me. And I'm not talking about going out to lunch and someone choosing a burger for you. This is bigger than that. Where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. I'm not talking about that. Do that all day, every day. But if I don't choose to be a father to my children, if I don't choose to be a good husband to my wife, if I don't choose to wake up every morning and choose to see the good, if I don't choose to control my thoughts rather than my, my thoughts having control over me, if I don't choose to trust Jesus and follow him even through the storms, through the trials, through the difficult seasons in my life, I'm not even giving myself a chance. You see, regardless of the insecurities that we struggle with, and if you're anything like me, you've got insecurities. And I know that I've got them, so I know you got them. No matter how good you are at hiding them, I know you got them. But regardless of the insecurities that we struggle with, regardless of our past mistakes, regardless of what's waiting for us around the bend that we couldn't possibly know, can't possibly see, regardless of what others have said or done to us or maybe what we've said or done to ourselves, we still have to choose to stand up. We still have to choose to step up to the plate and we still have to choose to do what? Swing, Swing the bat. Not only for yourself, but for your husband, your wife, your children, your family, your health, your church. We can just keep going on and on and on and on. The ripple effect, because you chose. Because you simply, you chose. And you fill in the blank for yourself. What are you needing to choose to do? And I believe that God is, he's gonna speak to us through this brand new series that I'm calling Choices. And the first message that I wanna share with you today, I'm calling Choose to See the Good. Choose to see the good. Would you look at your neighbor and say, choose to see the good. Choose to see the good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for who you are. Lord, we need you. And we pray, Lord, for your wisdom, your direction, your anointing, your favor to be upon the reading and the teaching of your word, that we would be changed from the inside out for your glory and for our good. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want us to go. Actually, I'm going to read to you Philippians, the fourth chapter, the first verse. You can go there. I'm going to be reading out of the Message Bible. It's going to be kind of hard to, to follow along because um, this translation is really, it's uh, like the English language. I really, really like the way it puts it here. So Philippians was written by Paul and he was writing to the church at Philippi, the Philippian church. And he says to them, he says, my dear, dear friends, I love you so much. That's a good way to start, right? I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy. You fill me with such pride. And I wanna just kind of take a pause and just say, when I was reading this, I was like, man, I feel the same way about, about this church. I feel the same way about my church. And you could say the same thing. It's your church, my church. This is the Lord's church where Jesus is Lord, but we're a family here. You know, we may have uh, different mothers. We may all look different and unique in our own way. We ha have different DNA running through our veins. But what brings us together is Christ. He's the glue that put us together and that keeps us together. And I want you to know that every time we meet together, every time I see you walk through those doors or I see you drive into the parking lot, or, or, or I see you on a, on, at, at a connection group. Or, or on Wednesday night, we're not even able to see each other face to face. You can see my face, but, but, but looking through that, that lens, and I'm sitting right over here, just in case you were wondering. I sit right about, right about here. Get it all right so the lights are all good. The lights uh, make it look all schmancy, fancy schmancy. Um, but when we get together, I'm, I'm filled with such a sense of pride and joy. 
Because I know that what God is doing in me, he's also doing in you. And when I hear your, the testimony of, of, of who God is to you and what he's doing in your life, in your family, in your finances, in your health, in every area of your life, it pumps me up. And it help, it, it, honestly, it helps keep me going. Sometimes, some weeks, you, you won't be able to tell, but sometimes I'll just be really tired. And I'll just be, maybe you're thinking, well, I feel the same way. Pastors aren't supposed to feel that way, right? Yeah, I'm human. Sometimes I sit down to write a message and I don't even know what I'm going to write, let alone a series. But when I think of you and we come together and I hear uh, you speak of the testimonies of the goodness of God, I feel such a, a sense of pride and joy. So I know I kind of feel like I know what Paul is saying to the church, the Philippian church. He says, you make me feel such joy. You fill me with such pride. I'm super thankful for you. This is an amazing thing we've got here, you know? And what he says, he says, don't waver. Stay on track. Steady in God when you feel like giving up. Remember what we've got. He says, so don't waver. He goes on in that second verse. He gets a little personal here. He says, I urge Euodia, calls him out. Sintich calls out these two ladies to iron out their differences and make up. It's like, Paul, really? It's like, it would be like me writing, writing a letter and saying, Gail and Marion, get your act right. <laughs> get your differences in order. He says here, he says, iron out, make sure they iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want his children holding grudges. And oh yes, Sazygus, since you're right there to help them work things out, do your best with them. You know, help them to resolve these issues. I saw when I was there with you, how good you, you were working well with them. And they, they seem to listen to you. You seem to be like the peacemaker in the middle of all of this. He said, these women worked for the message hand in hand with Clement and me and with the other veterans. Worked as hard as any of us. Remember their names are also in the book of life. He's saying, they may have things that they're dealing with that they're going through, but their names are written down in the book of life. So don't discount them. Don't discredit them. Help them out. Through, through the issues that are going on. He goes on and says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. I mean, throw parties. Make it as clear as you can to all that you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see the master, that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. It reminds us of our, of our night of worship and prayer. When we come together and we pray with each other and for each other, we're turning, turning our worries into praise. We're turning our petitions in, into, into praise. What does he say here? He says, let petitions and praises shape your worry. So we are, are the things that we're going through, we turn those things into worship. And as the worship goes up, God's favor and his blessings, his anointing comes down. It's because we're not wavering. We're not giving up when we feel like it. Even when we're tired, we're gonna bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord not for my glory, but for his glory. And if it turns out for his glory, it's going to turn out for my good. It's letting God know your concerns. I love this. He says, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm just kind of just asking you answer to yourself. How many of you have ever come to church you almost didn't make it or you just knew you weren't going to, but you just kind of forced yourself to do it. And then 
after it was all said and done, you were so glad that you did. Because the headache that you had before you came, it was gone. By the end of service, it was gone. Or maybe an issue that you were really struggling with and dealing with, it was really just hammering on you all week. You come into the house of the Lord, you give it to God. And what does Paul say happens? He says, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. Not, not necessarily that the issue or the situation disappears or goes away. Yeah, but on the inside, you know that nothing out here is gonna be able to affect what's in here. And that's a peace that can only come from God. The world is seeking after this peace, church. We, we were all there. We were searching, and sometimes we get tempted to, to do the same thing, and we get bit in the butt when we try to go back and do the, the old things again. But when we come back and we give it to God, he comes and he settles us down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces or removes worry at the center of your life. He goes on and he says, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do, your be do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true, that are noble, that are reputable, that are authentic, that are compelling, that are gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise. Stop fixing and focusing your mind on things to curse. He says, put into practice, begin to apply what you've learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. He says, do that. And God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. In other words, the God of peace will be with you. Paul is telling the Philippian church, the best possible scenario, the best possible outcome for you as individuals, as families, as the church, as a community will happen as you make the choice to see the good. It's a choice. We don't just automatically see, see the good, right? It's a choice that we have, to be, uh, we, have, we have to be intentional about, to fill your mind and to focus your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, things that are excellent and worthy of praise, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse, because whatever you choose to look for will be the very thing that you find. And this little nugget that I'm gonna give to you is super simple, but it will change your life. You're gonna find what you're looking for. That's in your relationships, that's in your education, that's in your children, that's in your marriage, that's in your health. Whatever you find, or whatever you look for, it will be the very thing that you find. Can I hear someone say, I'm choosing to see the good? It's something that Paul is saying that we have to be intentional about. It's not something that's going to happen on accident. It's not something that comes natural for many, if, if, if not most normal people. We have any normal people in the house? None? No normal? Normal people in the house? All right. Any normal people online? Okay. All right. If we're being honest this morning, it can be really difficult. Is it okay if I'm being honest this morning? That's what we came for, right? If we're being honest this morning, it can be really difficult when you're talking to someone who has a booger hanging out of their nose. Every time they, they breathe in, you see it kind of like jet toward the back. They breathe out, it kind of vibrates a little bit. And you're just like, wow, I didn't sign up for this, but let's go, you know? Sorry, Gail. That's the only thing you to remember in the message, too. 
Or, or, or if they have a pimple on their chin that's super ripe and ready to go, right? <laughs> you didn't think I can get better than that, okay. Or maybe they have like breakfast stuck in their teeth. Sometimes it's super hard to not allow that to be the focus. We have such a hard time hearing what they're saying because the booger in their nose is screaming so much louder than the words that are coming out of their mouth. And what I'm saying is, if we're gonna hear what they're saying, if we're gonna settle a disagreement, if we're gonna have a meaningful and productive conversation, I'm gonna have to be intentional about where I'm allowing my focus to be. And sometimes it's not easy. Most of the time it's not easy. Because we've got, we're filtering through all the things that we already know, what people have said about them, what we've seen them do, how many times we've seen them screw up, And we're filtering through all that mess. And for some people, they'll never see the good because they're only looking for the flaws. It's a dangerous place to be. As your pastor, I want you to know that I choose to see the good in you. Because I believe that I'm gonna find whatever I'm looking for. If I choose to see the flaws, I know that I'm gonna find them because I know that they're there. It's not that hard. It's like picking cherries. It doesn't take much effort. And if you wanted to, it would, it would be just as easy for you to do the same to me. And I know people already do. We encountered that. You see, if you're choosing to look for the faults in someone, guess what? You're gonna hit the mother load. You're gonna find the very thing that you're looking for. But Paul, he says, choose to see the good. Make a choice. Make a decision that you're gonna see the good. You, it may not even be visible with the naked eye. It may not even be, it may not even exist yet. It may not be happening at the moment or in the moment, but we are able to choose what we see and what we're gonna see. And so when I look at you, I see that you were created in the image of God. And if you were created by God, I wanna remind you that God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make accidents but he created you on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. And when I look at you, I see a masterpiece. Ephesians, the second chapter, the 10th verse, Paul uses these words. He says, for we are God's what? Masterpiece. We are God's what? Masterpiece. Come on, come on, people. This isn't, yeah. We are God's yeah look at your neighbor maybe this will help you look at your neighbor and say you are God's masterpiece that's what I find a lot of times you are a lot more willing to say it to someone else before you were willing to say it to yourself I know that that's true with me I was just telling Felicia the other day how and we, were, we agreed about this but that how we we tend to, we're, we're a lot more difficult on ourselves than we are on, on the people around us. I think, Mike, you even mentioned this at our, at our men's breakfast yesterday. But we're so much more willing to be lenient with others sometimes before we'll be lenient to ourselves. And to realize, and so what, what, what it will do, it will hinder us from being who God created us to be because we're not willing to see how he sees us. We see all the flaws. We see the booger in the nose that's doing the vibrating thing. We see the pimple on the chin. We see the food in the teeth. We, 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 we have the smells and we allow those things. We, we know our past and we have a, a kind of an idea of what we want our future to be, but kind of, we've kind of figured that it's not gonna really pan out the way that we wanted it to. And so what we'll do is we'll discount and discredit ourselves. 
And what in, in return, what that does, it hinders us in our life with our relationships with others because we bring that chip on our shoulder into, into the next relationship. And people are wondering, what's wrong with you? You're beautiful. What's wrong with you? You've got everything that I could ever possibly want in a friend, in a husband, in a wife, in a teacher, in a student. And they just can't see it in themselves. But I want you to see here that you are God's masterpiece. He says he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. And if you will choose to see the good that is in you, God will take that good in you and he will allow that to be good for, the, for others around you. And it'll work out for the good of the people around you in your life. So not only is God's plan and purpose for us to see the good, but also to do the good and to join him in the good work that he's been doing in the world in and through his creation all this time. And this may seem like a super simple message, and maybe it is, but I truly believe that if you'll begin to apply the contents of this message to your life, your relationships, your health, your job, your business, the way that you look at yourself, the way that you see the world, you'll begin to see a world of difference. I promise you. You'll begin to change. You may not see stuff changing out here, but you'll notice that on the inside you start changing. How do, how do you know that? Because the stuff out here doesn't affect you and influence you the way that it used to. Because in here you're good. In here you're secure. In here you understand that the God of peace is not just by your side and not just for you, but he's living in you. You'll notice that when you begin to change your perspective, when you begin to change your focus, that when you stop looking for the ugly and you start looking for the beautiful, when you stop looking for the worst and you start looking for the best, you'll always find what you're looking for. Ah, oh, so, it sounds so simple, but oh, if we begin to apply this to our own lives. I'm not saying to be naive. And the message this morning isn't that you would become a pushover, but actually is quite the opposite. But I'm encouraging, encouraging you instead to stand strong, to stand firm. Like Paul said, without wavering, to be steady in your faith in God through Jesus Christ. Because it takes more strength to see the good. It takes more will and determination and being intentional to choose to fix your focus, not on the blaring insecurities and shortcomings of the people around you, but to see the good, to see the beautiful, to see the things that are praiseworthy, not only in the people around you, but in yourself. You see, when we choose to focus on the worst, the ugly, things to curse, when we choose to focus on the flaws, what I found in my own life is that we'll find ourselves constantly irritated, constantly bickering, constantly agitated, constantly annoyed. Because everywhere you look, it's like the Scrooge, right? Everywhere you look, bah humbug. But Paul, he says that when we choose to fix our focus on the good, he says, when we put into practice what you've learned from me, what you've heard and saw and received from me, he says, do that. And God, the one who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Another translation says, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, if anyone knew, Paul knew a thing or two about seeing the worst in people. Seeing the ugly and looking for things to curse. And it's funny how 
his life got flipped upside down or got flipped right side up, right? In his own words, he says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was bold when it came to putting others down. You see, Paul was the very one who was persecuting. He was capturing. He was imprisoning and even killing Jesus' followers. But it wasn't until God came to his rescue and saw beyond his flaws. God came to Paul's rescue and saw exactly, so he saw beyond his flaws and saw exactly what he needed. And it was then and only then that everything changed. A Christian killer. A Christian capturer would turn his life around to become a Jesus follower. Are you kidding me? If God can do that in Paul, he can do that in you. If I'm just saying, if he can do that in me, I really think he can do it in you. We see in 1 Timothy, the first chapter, the 12th verse, he's, Paul is writing this letter to his understudy, Timothy. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. That's something that I, I'll never understand. The God of all creation, giving his good message, his good news, the gospel message of Jesus Christ for salvation. He put it in us who are super flawed. I want, you to, I want you to take this good news and I want you to share it with everyone else. He considered me trustworthy and he appointed me to serve him, a Jesus uh, follower killer. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Maybe for the same reasons why maybe you've been rejected by people your whole life. Paul says, Christ came to me. And even in my insecurities, even in my flaws, even in my ignorance and unbelief, God had mercy on me. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was, exclamation point. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus didn't come into the world to start a country club with exclusive members, with a membership fee. He came into this world to do what? To save sinners, to save the lost, to redeem you, to redeem me. He says, and I am the worst of them all. Stop bragging, Paul. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. And we could all say the same things about ourselves. He says, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All glory or all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone, talking about Jesus, is God. Amen. It is finished. So be it. You see, when we choose to see the good, not only are we doing what is right, but we are putting ourselves in a position to live, to love, and to look like our Savior, Jesus Christ. To show mercy to others is showing the mercy that was first shown to us. That Christ came and gave his life for us while we were still lost, while we were still sinners. 
And when others see the mercy that God had on you, lived in and through your life, Paul says, then they will receive or that they will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Can I hear someone say, I'm choosing to see the good. It's a choice. 